And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Tommy Martinez. Yes, sir. Who uh, beat me to Awatuki. He got here and uh, he started the burrito company in 1982. And I started my dental office in 1987, five years later. And you're probably wondering, why do you want to uh, hear a podcast of the burrito company? I, I think these stories in Awatuki are legendary. I mean, it's one thing when you go uh, to Taco Bell... You, you don't know who owns Taco Bell. You don't even know who the CEO of Taco Bell, but this is a pillar of the community. I mean, he's a privately owned, owns the burrito company since 1982. I've known him for 30 years. When he walked to my house today, I just cracked up laughing. But well, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, yeah. Now, I'll make a correction on the ownership. Now, my sister, Margaret De La Cruz, is the owner now, the presently owner. Well, I was trying to give yeah. you all the credit. Yeah, thank so, you very so much. You're, you're sister, I am the founder, yes. You're, you're the you're the co-founder. Yeah. With your well, sister. Well, I'm the founder, and then she's now the uh, owner. And that's your sister. Yeah. Margaret. So so you lost it, the burrito company on a poker game or a bet or <laughs> was it a card well, game playing the Raiders? It was. Let's call it <laughs> like uh, yeah. As a business venture, what I did, I went into a, a big project downtown back in uh, 1980. Uh, 19 what? Uh, in 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 the 90s. There was a big project downtown, and I became an anchor tenant there. So at that time, I um, I jumped out of the burrito company here in Owatuki, and that's when my uh, sister and um, her son and husband took over management, and uh, which they did, and they kept it going, and they they did a great job of um, what it is now, you know. So, so, so do, you, do you not own it at all? Now your sister owns it. Owns it. My sister owns it. But I'm there. I'm there. You're there? Yeah. So now you work, I, so my, do you work for heart, her? Yeah, huh? Do you work for her? I work for her. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yes. Well, um, it's been an amazing story. Um, so when I started going there in 1987, um, it was on the, the side strip there. That was, yeah. And you had a nice outdoor patio. Mm -hmm. And uh, my office right there by Safeway, so we just yeah, walk across I the I remember, street, yes. Rock across the goalie. I remember quite well. And I used to always uh, tease my uh, dental assistant who would drive, and I'd say, come on, in, in, in Europe, people routinely walk a mile. You can't walk across the street. I remember one time, remember when there was that chicken, where the, where the uh, biscuit? Yes. There used to be a chicken house there. Well, anyway, my staff, when they would go eat them on the other side of the parking lot, they'd all get in a car yeah. and drive across the parking lot. I'm like, come on, you can't you can't walk across the parking lot. <laughs> and, and then after work, they'll go to a gym and get on the yeah. Stairmaster for an hour. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, so um, so w I love your story um, about starting the burrito company. AT. So you're born in Phoenix. Correct. Um, can I can I say the year you're born, or is, or is that private? Oh, that's, that's okay. What year were you born? 1946. 1946. So the year, so you're the original baby boomer. Correct. Or is baby boomer sort of 45 or 46? I guess it's still 45, I guess. 45? Yeah. And, and that's, and baby boomers last year started turning 70. Mm -hmm. And this year they started turning 71. You're born in 46, so you're 72. And you look marvelous. Thank you. Do you credit that to burritos? I <laughs> is that so you well, eat a burrito every day? You're gonna look like yeah, Tommy yeah. at uh, age seventy two. Yeah. Well, I I think it's just the way of uh, you're just like your your life in general. You just respect it. You know, I I eat well and I exercise well and I have a good environment at home and uh, so good good. Um, Good resource of friends. Come on, this is Awatuki Uncensored. We tell the truth. Tell the truth. You're uh, single and you had no children. That's why you look. That's why. Probably. That's why you look at something too. Yeah. See what happens to me after you have four children? You My look God. good. You look good. Uh, they, everyone thought I was Brad Pitt until yeah. I had four yeah. kids. And uh, so, 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 born in '46. So, how old were you in 1982? Um, Here, I got to calculate. Yeah, calculate that. I'll have to calculate that. That's why God made Google. Um, there it is. So, uh, 1982 mm, minus 1946. Okay. You were 36 years old. 40. So, so tell us about your journey, um, from four, well, 1946 well, to 1982. Yeah, well, uh, when I, I, uh, got out of the university, I graduated with a BFA in fine arts and I got a job at Honeywell being a uh, technical illustrator and photographer. And uh, that's when um, they were on, uh, they manufactured the big frame computers. It was called Honeywell Information Systems. 
So Microsoft came into the picture, and then all of a sudden, the big frame computers, yeah, that was it. And um, so we had an opportunity to kind of scramble around the, within the company and find out other positions, and I, I had enough with Honeywell, I said, after working 14 years for them. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do something that has not been done before. And uh, a restaurant, I've always have liked to cook. And uh, I remember my mom's cooking at home and uh, anything rolled up in a tortilla, whatever you found in the stove, whatever you found in the refrigerator, you throw it, you know, you wrap it on a tortilla and it was always good, you know, even if you put a little mayo, it would be great. So uh, then I had these friends of mine that work at, uh, at uh, Honeywell that resided here in Awatuki and they called me up and they said, look Tom, there's a place here in Awatuki, you always talk about opening up a restaurant, right? A good little cute little place, yeah? Well, there's a place right here. I, don't, I think the man is ready to sell. It was called Top Potato. It was called what? Top Potato. Top Potato? Yeah, it was baked potato topping with whatever favorites oh. you wanted. Okay, right. and, and, and in the place where you were uh -huh. for years. So I came in there knocking on the door, and he was really upset. He said, "I don't want to talk to you. Just here's the card to my agent." I went and talked to her, and and she she gave me the price, and I made an offer, and half of what they wanted, and they accepted it. Offered half of what they wanted, and they accepted it. And and why do you think he wanted to sell? Was he burned out, or was it not working? He wasn't. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. As a matter of fact, I came at lunchtime. He was sitting by himself in the dining room. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a great idea and it didn't work. So I had a great idea. Yeah, he, and mine worked. I mean, from the first day that I opened, it started work, and that place has never has been on the black every day one. Nice. Congratulations yeah. to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so you left at eighty two. Was that also? Was that about the? Uh, uh, that wasn't the time when uh, Honeywell was also uh, GE made an offer to merge with them. Right. I started actually. I started with General Electric. Okay. And then and then merged with uh, with Honeywell. With Honeywell. Okay. Yeah. And uh, was GE a better owner than Honeywell? Did you like Honeywell better after GE bought it, or did that take it? It didn't, or didn't matter. It, it didn't make too much difference. Didn't matter. I mean, we had the same group and the same benefits and the whole thing, so it was kind of neat. I was on Central Avenue up at the eighth floor, look over my 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 desk, my drawing desk, and the whole thing it was. Really I got, I was cool. trying to think of one of the earliest stories I remember of you. And I remember um, talking to you, it had to be, I opened up in 87, I think it was around 87, and you were telling me that Gilbert had a water tower, and that water towers, I'd never thought about it before, but I do remember in Kansas, I thought it was weird that when tornadoes would come through, a town <laughs> would be level, but the water tower would still be there. And that was because those things were built to hold water at eight pounds a gallon. Yeah. And there was, I guess there was one in Gilbert that they weren't using and you were going to drain the water yeah. and put a restaurant up there. Do you remember Correct. that idea? That idea was a friend of mine. His name was Marley Porter. He was an associate uh, uh, architectural professor at ASU. And, uh, he said, and he said, um, Tom, I have a great idea. And he says, why don't we open up a restaurant? He said, we'll go partnership and, it's called, and we'll call it Tommy's. He says, on the water tower. I says, what, are you serious? Yeah. So we took a drive and he showed me. Right on the base of the water tower, do the restaurant, and then halfway up, we do a little terrace overlooking the town. We did the architectural render. We did a business plan, presented it to the city council. They liked it. They loved it. But the only problem was there was no sufficient parking to facilitate. Ah. So the Is city, the water tower still there? Uh-huh. Is it yeah. not being used? I have no idea. I haven't been over it for a long time. I have no idea. Yeah. You, you should revisit that idea because you, you, you know... Well, the, that's the whole thing. And here's the story. That was, in order to make it possible, there was a property, pro, a private property, and there's the world old-timer family that probably migrated from, from Oklahoma, maybe, you know, whatever. So I think there were like three bachelor sons and the old lady and the old man. So we said, well, we want to buy the property. For the parking. He says, yeah, well, you need to relocate us. And each one of us, we want a residence. There was no way. So that was impossible. So. Wow. And uh, and when I, we had that discussion, when you drove down Ray uh, 48th Street, it stopped yeah. at Ray. Yeah. And was just... Uh, uh, no, it was going to be beautiful. As a matter of fact, the, I, I wish I would have known we would talk because they still have the architectural rendering. Yeah. Wow. It would have been beautiful, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. That I thought it was great. And I was thinking of you, um, it was like 10 years later I was thinking of that conversation we had because yeah. 
Um, I was at a dental convention in Columbus, Ohio, and um, you know how um, a lot of the uh, um, old, old Catholic churches, the, the, the neighborhood disappears, it turns commercial, yeah. and they uh, close down and, and they have to close locations. And somebody picked up in Columbus, Ohio, this 100-year-old Catholic church and turned it into a restaurant and called it, I think they called it the, the refractory or the, um, I, I, I forgot what it was called, but growing up Catholic, I, mean, I went to Catholic high school, grammar school, I went to Catholic college, Creighton. My two oldest sisters went straight into the nunnery out of high school. I mean, they both went to the nunnery when they were Correct. 18. And I thought, I wonder if they would think this was sacrilegious or whatever. So I wanted to eat there. So we, we ate there. It was gorgeous. Everyone loved right. it. it. It was so cool. And, and, and the guy got it on a dime because it was chain link fenced around there. I mean, the only other thing that could have been done with it is to hit it with a bulldozer. I think it's okay as long as you move the sanctuary. <laughs> Bless the sacrament. <laughs> The, the, yeah, 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 yeah. There, there was no altar. Well, there's a similar thing that happened here in Phoenix, uh, right on downtown, near downtown on 7th Street. I tell you, you're Catholic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was not. Um, there was an old Methodist church right in the corner of uh, Osborne and 7th Street. And now uh, it's been turned into a restaurant. It's a Mexican, Mexican restaurant. Phenomenal. It's packed. Inside. A Methodist church has been turned into a Mexican restaurant? Uh-huh. See, I figured if it was Methodist, it would be turned into like a casino or something. <laughs> Very close to it. Huh? <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that that is neat. That is uh, that is neat. You know, I, I noticed um, living here for 30 years that um, some developers um, always refer to the historical society as yeah. a hysterical society. They, they, they think they're nuts. So like, you yeah. Know, if they had it their way, you know, you'd, there'd yeah. still be uh, saloons downtown Phoenix. Okay, well, can I uh, speak, speaking of historical or hysterical, <laughs> uh, there's a building that actually my sister Margaret owns downtown Phoenix. It's, an old, it's, it's over 100 years old building. And that's where the second burrito company is going. Well, now, when does that happen? Well, it's going to happen. It's finally the, all the drawings have been accepted and, and per that is now, is Margaret your older sister or little sister? She's a younger sister. I'm the oldest. How, how many how many kids were in your family? There were eleven of us. Eleven. So I already knew you were Catholic. Yeah. I, I didn't have to ask you were Catholic. Just <laughs> there were uh, seven kids in my family. You have to be Catholic or, or Mormon to Mormon. have uh, families that big. Yeah. So eleven kids in your family. How there were eleven old? siblings? Yeah. And and the burrito company's recipe would you credit to your mom? The well, certain certain uh, certain recipes. The fact is, is that of course I have the all the recipes. The fact is, that I got to do it to myself. My my travels to Mexico, I even took classes in in cooking in in culinary in Mexico City, and uh, I've uh, and everything's about borrowing here and there, what have you, you know. And I I traveled extensively into Mexico, ever since I was 18 years old. I've been going to Mexico City. And I even took a class in art when I was studying art. And uh, so I fell in love with the cuisine. And I've always been aficionado. In the I got a collection of cookbooks, like you can imagine. Really? So, yes. So, yeah. Really? Um, well, let's talk about the, the, the generic term Mexican food, because I, I don't really... It's a broad genre. I mean, yeah. I think Mexican food tastes very different in just one state over in Albuquerque. And when I go down, just cross the line down um, um, Rocky Point. Well, the, the, the whole thing has a, uh, a, is based on, on a, a, the history of the cuisine availability, you know. First of all, you have, you have a driver climate and whatever is accessible in that region, they, they'll cook according to that region. You see what I'm saying? Where California is a lot more, it's not really a desert, so they have more vegetables and things like that. So. And in New Mexico, everything either cold or hot. So chilies would be fresh or either dried up. And uh, so the cuisine is a little bit different. And uh, like, it's just, I, I would say probably, you know, like even in Mexico, you go anywhere in Mexico from Yucatan, it's totally different from being to Sonora. Because Sonora could grow wheat, so they had more flour tortillas, where yeah. down south was only right. the flour. Right. The flour tortilla is, is basically is used, had been used in the northern part in Chihuahua and Sonora. Now the flour tortilla has great influence. It really has kind of spread all the way down to, to into the interior of Mexico. 
But it started out in northern, though, yeah, because the northern they could grow, part, yeah, they could the grow wheat part. there. Yeah, it started by the, the indigenous women of Mexico. Yeah. And, and, and and when you go to really south, like uh, um, I've done some missionary dental trips in Chiapas and uh, Adiac, and basically everything you sell at your restaurant, you, you there's, it's not even on the menu. I mean, when I would say those, I mean, I would look at their menu now. It was mo mostly uh, like seafood and, and, and other stuff, and I'd say, well, do you guys have like a burrito or a taco of course they're not. Be like no no of course not it's yeah just, i mean so, yeah well see, and so you think i'm in mexico well, i should be able to thing. get mexican it's the same food. thing like you could you know you would say what is like for instance if you you have food from from new jersey or boston you go to new orleans you're not going to find the same type of food yeah. but you're still in the united states yeah you know even people of chicago says we make the best pizza nobody else can make the better pizzas we do yeah you know so that's the way it goes. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge variety, and, and and even you know, but it's very different. Like I remember the first time I went to uh, Albuquerque, and I ordered uh, two cheese enchiladas. Um, she, it had a fried egg on it, and I, I I'd never seen that before. I'm like, I didn't even I didn't even ask for that. that and, yeah, that's a very and, and traditional. Then, and then you go one state over to Texas, yeah, and they they call Mexican food Tex Mex. It's so there's three states in California to Arizona to New Mexico to Texas. Four totally different, different types yeah. of Mexican food. Totally different. And uh, the New Mexican food, it doesn't have a very, very extensive choice. It's either red or green chili, mostly red. Fry egg, as you say, or either pork, abalobado, and, and beans. And, uh, and the tortillas, the flour tortillas, are a little more, a little heavier tortillas. A little, they call them more like gorditas, they call them, you know. And... So, so let's, uh, there might be a lot of kids watching this, and, and just, just everybody, but uh, I want to ask you two uh, culinary questions. On a tortilla, what's going through your amazing mind when you think corn versus flour, and on chilies, red versus green? What, what culinary thoughts do you have when, um, well, flour, corn versus flour, well, tortilla? Well, corn, corn would be a lot more green. healthier, supposedly. You know, corn would be a lot healthier. But then if it was a flour tortilla, if it's handmade, homemade, there's nothing better than having a good handmade, homemade tortilla, flour tortilla. You know, it's, it's really just very special. So very what, special. what do you sell more of at the burrito company, corn or flour? Oh, flour, of course, because we make the burrito. We specialize, like, for instance, if, if you have a sandwich bar, you, Sandwich shop, you, you're going to use bread, right? So, 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 do you even make a corn tortilla? No, we have everything factory made. Yeah. No, but yeah. I mean, but do you sell a corn tortilla? Yeah. At Burrito Company. But most of your sales are flour tortillas. Flour tortillas. Like what percent is flour and what percent is corn? Oh, it's like flour, like I would say 80, 85%. 80, 85%, and 15% corn? Yeah. And um, chilies, uh, red or green? What, what's the difference and what the, are your well, what we sell the, the the green chili is like a number one seller the green the green chili and is, is, is that because it's more that. mild or more or, or is no it they like it hot so green is hotter yeah and that's your favorite well even the red could be so that we we make it hot we use the green chili that's hot and uh we we as a matter of fact our green chili comes from new, it's a it's a roasted green chili but it comes frozen from new mexico okay it's frozen but the, the, it's because of the quantity that we use, okay? And, uh, and the way that we, we prepare it, it's like what makes it. That's what really makes it. And uh, green chili is number one. And the red chili, I got to say, the red chili is really good because the fact is that we don't use, uh, we, we use dry chili pods and we use three different types of green chili, red chili, dry chilies, all incorporated, all grind up. And, cooked and grind up and the whole thing and it made into a wonderful one of red sauce great great tip. so now when i was little i grew up in wichita kansas and my dad owned a sonic drive-in chinese a sonic drive-in oh, okay so um back in the day you know i was born in 62 when i was 10 years old me and my five sisters um because my little brother wasn't born until i was like 17 yeah. but we used to have to like the onion rings we had to peel the onions we had to slice them. We, we made all the onions by hand, yeah. and our, oh my God, your eyes would burn and water. And, and there was a, um, a walk-in refrigerator, and sometimes the onions would burn your eyes. You'd walk in the refrigerator and, and put your eyes in front of the, 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 
the air conditioner fan. Yeah. And it helped. So I was wondering, um, does uh, working with all those chilies, is that kind of like working with onions? Is that yeah. burn your eyes or fingers? Or? It doesn't It doesn't burn your eyes. It burns your fingers. Probably you don't use it properly. But let me go back to where you're talking about the, with the differential between the red and the green, okay? And how the old... The green chili, basically the old days where there was no refrigeration or what have you back, okay? So the green chili, when it's, when it's picked, when it's picked, it's green. So then the dishes will be prepared with green chili. Just like the green corn tamales, they'll use the corn is fresh, uh, the chili is fresh, they put a little cheese, they'll make tamales, okay? So then they start preparing for the winter. So they will dry the corn, they'll dry the chili, and then in the winter time, you do the red chili, and then you do the dry corn, and you do the red, the, the red corn, the, the red chili tamales, and you use the red chili, the pork or beef, whatever. So you see that what it was last, the old days, you know? Yeah, that is it. So, so, if, if, so what are, um, so if I ask you, what, what are the number, what is the top number one thing that people eat at the burrito company and what, what would be the top three? What, what's your top three most popular items that people come to? The green chili. I would say the green chili. The green chili what? The green chili burrito? Uh-huh, green chili burro. Oh, you call them burro? Uh-huh. Yeah. We, basically, that's what people come and eat the burritos, okay? And uh, we have the green chili burrito, which is the number one. I would say probably we have a barracoa beef. It's, it's, a, it's a real juicy shredded beef. Burro shredded. Barbacoa. Say it, say it. So. Barbacoa. Spell that. B-A-R. B-A-R. B-A-Q. B-A-Q? Yeah, Q-A. Q-A. Burro. And that's a pork? No, no, it's beef. Okay, that's a shredded beef. Yeah. That's number two. Yeah. Number two, and uh, carnitas, the pork carnitas. Oh yeah. Well, you're you're a healthy guy, and you said it's from eating well. Um, are you? Um, do you? Um, do you have a ve a, 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 a non uh, beef burrito? Do you have a vegetarian burrito? We have a vegetarian burro. Now is that very popular? Very popular. Then we sell also a burro that's only rice and black beans with pico de gallo. It's very popular. What's very popular, very seldom, is the breakfast burros. Yeah, that's yeah. that's probably the 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 majority of the business we do with you. Yeah, is we'll wake up on a Saturday or a Sunday and uh, yeah. run down. The they like the chorizo. As a matter of fact, the chorizo comes locally. It's made here locally by Shriners. Right, and, and chorizo is uh, uh, pork, right? Yeah. It, well, there's chor beef chorizo, oh, but ours is a pork yeah. because that's traditional. So, so you're a, you're a healthy guy. You you've seen all these diet fads for your whole life. Yeah. Uh, are you um, do you, are you a beef, a pork, or a ve or, or a veggie guy? I eat very little pork. I eat uh, some beef, and uh, I I like um, I like vegetables. So why do you not eat pork? Why? Yeah. You you think why why do you, or why do you think pork? Is less healthier than beef. You said you don't eat pork. Eat no, no, it's just a, just a choice. I'm not saying. This oh, is just that's flavor. Just a choice. It all depends. You know, it all depends how you pork. Because sometimes I I cook pork at home, and I'll I'll do a Yucatan pork, like cochinita pepil. What it'll do? You wrap it up, you know, marinate it, wrap it up in banana leaves, and you bake, and you just like bake it for hours, and just that just like open up the leaves, and and that thing just juicy. What have you? Get tortillas and whatever is juicy. It's great. And uh, the carnitas is pork also. If you cook the carnitas the proper way, they're just absolutely delicious. It's a matter of preference how it's cooked. Now, what's that dish? I, I've eaten it about probably five times in 30 years in Guadalupe. It's uh, intestines. Oh, trepitas. And it's a... Oh, or the... Uh, man manero? Menudo. Manero? Menudo. Yeah, manero. tripe. Tripe. Well, now, what, what is that? Is that beef, pig? Uh, yeah. Beef. That, that's cow intestine. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's the cow lining of this of the milk section of the milk the, the milk intestine, the milk stomach. Okay, so it's not intestine. Yeah. It, it's the lining of the the stomach or yeah. the lining yeah. of the mm -hmm. intestine. Huh. Now is that one of your favorites? Well, 
I don't eat it that much. It's just usually tradition. Usually that manula is prepared dry like during the winter and festive days and uh, like New Year's. It's supposed to be a, a great, great meal for hangovers. and. So it's a tradition, though, like, like turkey on Thanksgiving. Right. And, and uh, there's a lot of history on the manula because if you, there's a, like for instance, uh, in Spain, you have you have a dish that's prepared with tripe, okay? The Spaniards brought the tripe. Of course, the Spaniards are the one that brought the pork and they brought the beef into Mexico. In Mexico, prior to, you know, they used to eat a lot of game and, and also uh, wild turkey and uh, what it, chicken didn't exist until they... Really? They, so chicken didn't exist no, before no, the Spaniards? No, it didn't exist before, the, during the colonization of Mexico back in the 1500s. When Mexico was uh, uh, in, uh, doing exchange with with uh, the Orient, it was uh, you know from Philippines to Mexico and the, Mexico to the mother country. So on that exchange, that's when the uh, chicken came into uh, into Mexico from the Philippines. And uh, I did so, not know that. And yeah. so so they so the Spaniards brought chickens to Mexico. Yeah. And horses, right? Horses. And I didn't. I didn't want to yeah. say horses because I know you're traumatized. Horse. Because that beautiful horse that you had out there, <laughs> all the different colors. Somebody stole that damn horse. <laughs> that brought a lot of publicity. I don't care. That I was sad. Oh, you were glad. You were brought glad. a lot of publicity. <laughs> well, I thought number one, who the hell can steal that horse? And yeah. number two, well, sort of wonder. How, how do you not find? I mean, if, yeah. you're, if you're drunk, kids exactly. came home with the horse and yeah. burrito company. I mean. You're, you, you, somebody's going to realize there's a ten. How tall was that thing? Oh, it was like a carousel horse. Probably enough to mount a young child, like a five, you know, two, two five yeah. years old. Yeah. So, so it got you a lot of publicity. <laughs> yeah. The publicity was great. <laughs> it was worth it. <laughs> That's worth it. Well, how long have you had, you had that horse? Oh, my God. I think, I think, uh, I, I, think uh, I, I bought that horse probably like, Five years after we had opened, so in ninety, I was in, in since eighty seven. Yeah, I I I always associate that horse. Yeah. I was sad myself. Yeah, are, are you willing to give everyone in Awatuki a, a, a reward if they find that horse? Because yeah. that'll get you more publicity. All those <laughs> all those newspapers will come back and say the horse was found. Yeah. So what's the, are you going to give a reward for the horse? No, we just forgot all about okay, it. Okay, I'll give the reward a hundred bucks. I'll give 100 you a hundred dollar Benjamin. If you find that damn horse, if you're, and, and, and no charges, your son was obviously drunk. It's probably some scrap metal. It's probably, probably melted already. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now, yeah. did, did the horse have a name? It had no name. The horse with no name. That was a great <laughs> song. No name. Yeah. The horse with no name. Who sang yeah. that song, Ryan? Uh, the horse with no Who sang that? Remember that? I have no idea. Oh my Sounds gosh. Sounds like a country western. The oh, country no, song. That was a big, America. America. That was a, that was a big song in the seventies. A horse with no name. Oh yeah, that's right. No, yeah. Didn't say that, yeah. So that was Awatuki's original horse with no name. <laughs> Thirty years, and some drunk right. idiot sold it. Um, so, um, so you have Margaret has one location, the burrito company in Awatuki. Correct. And um, you think it's a good chance there's going to be a location number two downtown? Because a lot of people in Awatuki probably work downtown. I mean, yeah. This is yeah, the world's she, largest yeah, cul-de-sac. We're very excited about this project. Uh, dates are not sure yet. There's what about location? The location on Grand Avenue. Grand Avenue. And 10th. 10th Avenue, 9th Avenue and Grand. Grand and 9th Avenue? Uh-huh. And uh, build a picture. What, what's around Grand and 9th Avenue? Where would they be? Where would that be relationship? Well, no, I would say that would say probably relationships is like maybe a block and a half away from the new uh, Social Security building. Uh, there's, um, it's only about, I would say, like a mile from the uh, uh, ASU downtown. Okay. Uh, now, do you, you and Margaret live in that vicinity? No, Margaret lives um, Margaret lives out here by the mountains here. Uh, and I, I live in... In Ahwatukee? No, no, no. In Phoenix on the other side of the Levine area up in the mountains. Larry in Levine is area. Is Levine, what was that place they were building out there? What was that big housing development they were building out in Levine? Um, it was uh, a, but anyway, so she lives in Levine, so that's that's the uh, the next mountain over. Right, but she lives up in on twenty seventh on on uh, is it uh, 
Yeah, 27th Avenue, way up in the foothills. 27th Avenue and what? I mean, you mean in, in, in Ahwatukee? No, no, in Phoenix. Levine, going to Levine. Okay, so 27th Avenue and... Up to the mountains. Huh, okay. Yeah. Now, okay. I live downtown Phoenix, historical area. Oh, wow. The the guy who programmed this website, um, um, Tukey Town, lives down there. Oh, okay. And, and and all your street signs, you have the two street signs, and there's a third one on top that yeah. says historic area. Yeah. And, um... I've been, I've been in my house for about 45 years. 45 years? And when you're um, um, growing up with 11 children, is that about the same area of town? We grew up, we grew up in a little bit south of downtown Phoenix, in the other side of the tracks. Yeah. That's where we grew up. So, man, um, the, neat, the neatest thing I noticed about Ahwatukee is that, uh, you know, Ahwatukee didn't exist. I mean, when I got here in 87, I mean, it basically stopped at Ray Road. And so, so most everybody that lives here is a transient from somewhere. I mean, um, you've seen this city for 72 years. I know. How, how would you characterize uh, the growth of Phoenix in the last 72 years? Well, it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's just that's amazing. But the fact is that like, I... Like, do, you, do you know the population of Phoenix when you were born in 46? Oh, I think it was about like maybe 500,000. And then what would it be now? What? Well, you, you, was that 500... Thousand for the metro or for the the city of? I would say with well with the metro. Ryan, Google Google what was the population of Phoenix in 1946, and Google what was in 2017. But when you said about 500,000, was that like the whole metro or just the city limits? Well, I don't I don't think the whole I don't know what you were talking about the whole metro because the fact is is the city was just. See, I mean, I mean like had, Gilbert, had, Chandler. Yeah, so much farming. It was so much yeah. farming between Phoenix and and uh, and even Glendale. It's a huge farming area. And, um, and now it's all connected. Even from Phoenix to Tempe, remember there's a whole bunch of orchards. Right. Citrus orchards along, you know, uh, baseline all the way to Mesa. And uh, so, so, so is this, uh, m remember that movie Wall Street with uh, Michael Douglas? Uh huh. And he played that character Gecko. He said, greed is good. So do you, do you think that the greed of growing the town, do you, do you think this journey of Phoenix from, and greed is good, and this big city was good, or did you? Well, I, you think, I, you I think it was bound to happen. Bound to happen on the growth of scale. I'm a little disappointed as far as like uh, as far as the construction is concerned with the downtown. I think that we have some of the most ugliest high rise buildings. <laughs> uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, because I've always been, you know, uh, to be honest with you, when I was involved, when I was working at Honeywell, I was very much involved with with the arts in Phoenix. I was always involved, so. Well, you're, I'm, I'm going to depress you right now. In 1946, uh, the population when you were born of Phoenix was 65,414. That's the population of the city of Phoenix. And now it is 1.6 million. <laughs> oh my gosh. Did You were born in, the, in Phoenix when it had... Awatuki has more than 65,000. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. Do you realize that? My grandmother told Awatuki's me. bigger today than yeah. Phoenix was Phoenix, when you were born. Exactly. That is crazy. Okay. Downtown Phoenix, I remember when I was a child, well, downtown Phoenix, we used to go downtown Phoenix. And I, we, there was like on Washington, there must have been at least eight movie theaters. And there was one called Azteca, and they showed Mexican movies. I used to go with my grandmother to watch Mexican movies over to the Azteca. And we had to go through the Montgomery Wars, the J.C. Penney's, the A.G. Crafts, and um, they, I remember all those, those department stores were downstairs. Speaking of Mexican mothers, I got to ask you uh, your advice because I bet a lot of young couples are having this issue right now. Um, my own staff and patients for 30 years seems like if their mom and dad had a native language, whether it be Mexican or Farsi or wh yeah. whatever it was. They're always torn between, should I raise my kid bilingual? Is that the, the best deal? Or is that too much confusion? Well, I want to go English. And, and I have, I have, I have um, different Mexican dental assistants. One's so mad at her mom that she didn't teach her Spanish. Yeah. And then the other one is so glad that her mom forced her. And, and one, I, I think some of them have told me, that when they grew up, their mom and grandma would only speak Spanish, and their dad 
and schools that only speak English, and that was the mess. So, well, so what's your what's your uh, some some people say when you, you know, well, so what, what do you think? I, 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 the language, okay, Spanish being my first language, and and I think it had to do with lab, demographics, okay, because first of all, it, let's be let's be frank. Fact is, is that. You know, uh, the the ethnic groups used to, just like in New York or where big cities, the Italians stick together, you know, the new immigrants stick together, the, the Jewish stick together, Germans, whatever, you name it, okay? The Irish also, whatever, like in Boston. And in in the United States, this also happened as far as, like, you know, we call them barrios, okay? And so in the barrios there, just, you, know, you had grandmother lived there, maybe some aunts lived there, and everybody spoke Spanish. Even the local Chinese grocery store, they spoke Spanish. And then you went to your parish, and they had Spanish-speaking priests. Of course, there were priests from Spain, or whatever it might be. And so everything was in Spanish. You know, you, you went to your, your church services, it was Spanish. You went to your grocery store, and it was you know, Chinese people. They, were, they spoke Spanish, and everybody spoke Spanish until you went to school. That was the only... That, that was... It was a big conflict. First, first of all, because you were not allowed, and and the school that I went to was predominantly Hispanic, with a few, you know, non-Hispanic were other like maybe we had Native Americans or Asians, but and you were, you know, and then of course you were written up if you end up speaking Spanish in the in the campus. But hello, but that's the way it went, and uh, and I I think that. Uh, uh, due to discrimination, a lot of parents made decisions. We don't want our children to be discriminated, whatever. So we're going to make sure that they they learn English and nothing but English, and, and that's the way it went. And uh, so, but well, I, if a young couple is watching right now, and they got they just had a newborn baby. I no, what, what I think I think having a second language is very essential because it is a very small world, especially with social media and everything. It is a very small world, though. You know. And, uh, so you'd, rec think, you'd recommend bilingual? I'm bilingual, yeah. But you'd bilingual. recommend they raise your child today bilingual? I do recommend, yeah. 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 Would you rather have two cars or one? Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish, I, you know, you know <laughs> I shouldn't say this since I'm a dentist here, but uh, the only D, D I made in my entire life yeah. was in Spanish in high school. And uh, San Martin told my mom, she goes, uh, um, he, he just, he, he's not wired for this. And then that was funny because my mom made us all take piano lessons and my five sisters excelled at it. My piano teacher told my mom, she says, Howie couldn't carry a tune in a lunch pail. And then San Martin said, I can tell him the word 10 times in a row. And every time he says it differently. And I'm just in her begging mom. I hate taking Spanish and I hate playing piano. I really think some people are, have a gifted ear for language and music, and some people just didn't have that. It's, it's very true. It's very true. That, and like, for instance, my mother's side of the family are very, mus uh, they were mu very musical. Uh, she she had her brothers that played guitar and they sang. They wonderful. I mean, they had a great falsetto. I mean, these they were almost like they were. Well, two of them they they sang professionally. My mother played the piano, and uh, so and I think she was self taught. As a matter of fact, and she was a good piano player. And I remember that. So, she, you, so you agree she was probably born with talent yeah. that other people weren't born with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. They were yeah. very musical at that. Yeah. Yeah. In Ryan, Ryan's a great example. He had one piano lesson, and he can play the piano there like it was uh, yeah. whatever. And I took a year of piano lessons yeah. and uh, chopsticks. Yeah. And I knew this gentleman that he was gifted to pick up languages, just like that. Yeah. Yeah, he was able to, you know, he was, he was a, a Mexican-American, this a gentleman, but he spoke uh, uh, Italian, he spoke French, and he was learning how to speak uh, Japanese because he was going to make a trip to Japan, and he learned it. He was very good at it. You know, some people have their belt to, to do that. So, um, you're... Uh... I, I think at 72 years old, you've, you've earned your right as an elder. Uh, the, this is called Awatugi Uncensored, but I know you're never supposed to talk about sex, religion, politics, or violence. Um, but you did just mention the word earlier. You brought it up. You said, uh, but, you know, discrimination. They didn't want you to say this. Um, do, did you, have you seen discrimination 
um, from 1946 to 2017. Did you want to weigh in or opine on the Joe Arpaio deal, or do you just not want to even go there? Well, I'm just glad that he's not in office anymore, just to be polite. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of harm and damage done. You know, he's a lot of hero for a lot of people, and I can understand that for what they believe, and, uh, you know, he tried to protect people, but then, of course, uh, there was a um, lot, uh, lot of families were destroyed. Yeah. Did, did you see more discrimination in 46, 56, 66 than today? Is it getting no. better or is it getting worse? No, it was, I don't, I don't, I, there wasn't that much discrimination. I really, it wasn't that much. It was, it, you just, you, you stay, you stayed in your area and uh, people stayed safe. And uh, so uh, the only discrimination that I did see witness that really affected me a lot were the way, the way that the blacks were just, were segregated. Because we were segregated with the blacks too, and I remember the grade school, the elementary school that I went to, was predominantly Hispanic, with a few others, you know, let's say Asians or maybe. Uh, but then we have the, another elementary school just just a half a block away, and it was all black. And what, and what year was this? Well, um, when I was five years old, I'm talking about when I was five. So years 50, old. So in '51, in Phoenix. Blacks were segregated into different schools. Yeah. Wow. And as a matter of fact, the elementary school that I went to, we had the lunch room in the basement, and we would go and have lunch, and as soon as we got out of lunch, we all single file out of the basement, single file, and all the black children from the crew members, because they didn't have a lunch room, they'll be all lined up for us to get out so they can come and eat secondly. And then also we had, we had the public park with the swimming pool, and then all of a sudden you hear the whistle, from the lifeguard, that means out. And all the black kids would be ready to come into the swimming pool. No kidding. Yeah. And then the movie theaters, uh, some movie theaters on the balcony, only Hispanics and blacks on top, in the balcony. And who could sit on the bottom? Whites. And Asians? And I guess Asians. Even, where, where, where would even, the Chinese even, go? Even, even St. Mary's Basilica at that time, the there was not really a, 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 a shall we say a, 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 a place of worship for a lot of the early Hispanics in in, this, uh, in the valley or in the Phoenix area, so the Franciscans started providing uh, Spanish messes, but in the basement, in the basement of St. Mary's, until until they got together and they built the Hispanic community started building in Immaculate Heart, which is the ninth ninth in Washington, but they provided Spanish. Masses in Spanish only in the basement. You couldn't go to the main church. Gosh, John. And what, when would you say that type of behavior ended? I mean, open segregation. Well, it started, well, of course, it started with the movement, of course, with, uh, with Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez and all that, you know, during the, the Kennedy. Cesar Chavez yeah. and Martin well, Luther King. Right after the Kennedy administration, you know, the civil rights movement. Started right after the Vietnam War, you know, with, every, yeah. you know, started with a, the demonstrations against the war and everything else, the peacemakers and discrimination and equal rights and that whole movement. That's everything that took a, took a, that's when it started. And you know, Martin Luther King growing up in grammar school, Martin Luther was my favorite priest. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, uh, yes. the, you know, Catholics are big into saints and all this stuff. And, the, and uh, you know, they would, the, the nuns would ask you, well, you know, you'd, you'd have a homework assignment, write an essay or a paper on your favorite yeah. saint. And, and the reason Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther um, was my favorite saint is because um, he stood up to the Catholic Church. They, um, they would, uh, your mother died. So he'd say, well, your, your mother is burning in purgatory and she can't get into heaven until you get six silver pieces and it's here in the Bible. And Martin Luther is like, uh, these people speak German. They can't read the Bible. And so nobody he, did. So he was the first person ever to translate the Bible into German, the German. and um, it made the uh, Pope so mad that he sent you know to have him arrested, and a nun from the same order that my oldest sisters in a cloistered Carmelite monastery hit him in a wine barrel and put him in a horse and buggy and pretended that they, she was taking uh, wine um, to uh, um, um, England. And snuck him out of um, um, Germany because they, they thought the Knights of Columbus would kill him. 
And I and then he taped those ninety nine theses on, or ninety nine complaints. Well, the Knights of Columbus started here in the uh, United States. How could that be? Uh, my, maybe I had that part as well wrong, but the 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 Pope sent his people. Yeah, there must have been something else because yeah. uh, I thought uh, they were called the Knights of Columbus. Yeah, the Knights of Columbus. I think it's an organization that started here in, in the United States. Yeah, my dad was a fourth degree knight, but the um, but the um, I I, I thought and and then um, his ninety nine complaints. Eventually, they were all agreed to. So he was a true, not only was he a true pioneer, well, a true visionary. Yeah, well, if Martin Luther King lived now, he'd be very comfortable being a Catholic. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I've, never, I've never heard anyone say that. Yeah. I'll, I'll send an email to my two oldest sisters today and tell them uh, I just heard that. I, I think the very neat thing about social media is um, how many, uh, say it's a kid watching this in high school, um, you know, they're exposed to more of their elders in their community. And that, that's what I'm trying to do with Tuki Town is that I always felt that in Awatuki there was a, what I call the thousand points of light of Awatuki. Yeah. There, there's a, about a thousand people like you, doctors, it's teachers, great community. principals, it's a pastors, community. priests, yeah. that really tie this together. Yeah. And, and I want to, uh, and now with, um, ever since I came out with a smartphone, uh, it used to be when we were little, you, the only thing you would hear from someone like you is whatever ABC, CBS, NBC uh, fed we'll you. There was, there was three major networks and one newspaper, and those were the powers that be. They, they controlled uh, content. Yeah. And now what I think with podcasting is it's leveled the playing field. I don't have to go to ABC, CBS, NBC. Uh, I, I don't... There, there's not one um, editorial board of the Arizona Republic. Now... A 72-year-old strong pillar of the community can be talking directly to uh, a young couple um, for free. I mean, it's in no commercial. I mean, it's it's just very, very cool and and uncensored. And that's cool. why I call it uncensored because I I, I I'm a little challenged by this uh, uh, snowflake ideology that you can't talk about certain things, uh, you know. And I I think um, I think it, it's it's really refreshing. Uh, yeah. To hear people um, talk to other people like they would talk to their own child. Yeah, it's it's kind of cool. You know, it's kind of cool. Oh. It's just like, um, and I, uh, ever since I was a very child, I used to ask my grandmother questions about her background and where she came from and, and um, my grandparents. And uh, and I think I'm the only one in uh, in that of all the nephews and nieces and grandparents or whatever, because we have an extensive family because you must imagine that my mother was also a native Arizonian and raised in Phoenix and she, all, her sisters and brothers were also here in Phoenix and my dad's side of my dad's family, all her brothers and sisters also were raised in Phoenix. So you could see the extensive network of family going back, you know, couple generations back and uh, so in times they some uh, grandnephew is wants to know something about their ancestors so well let's call Uncle Tommy he might know <laughs> hey let's let's switch gears completely I got you it's it's 50 minutes I got you 10 minutes uh, hours are a brand um, what would you say to some guy out there who's tired of doing the daily grind of work, he's coming downtown, he sits in a cubicle all day, and he's always wanted to uh, start his own restaurant. And I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe new restaurants have like one of the highest mortality, I, I, I hear it's it one of the does. highest mortality businesses. I've been there. Yeah. So, I mean, I've heard stats as bad as like 80% of new restaurants go out of business in two years. Mm -hmm. What advice would you tell a young entrepreneur in Awatuki who's got his eye on an Italian restaurant, a bagel shop, a burrito company? Uh... Well, you know, the, 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 the basic formula they tell you, even if you take, uh, you know, Business 101, or they say, say location, location. Basically, that is number one. And I, I got to tell you, because that, and it's true, because the, the burrito company where it started, you know, you must understand that Alia Road was basically was a, the, the main street out from the into Awatuki because it was under construction at that time. From my tent, all the workers come and work in the morning, all the construction workers, you name it. They all had to enter and exit Alia Road, I think. That was the main street. 
And then right next we had, what, a convenience store, Circle K, with a guest pump. Everybody would come and get their six pack or whatever. It's exposure. Exposure, exposure, and there's location. I keep saying location. Well, but then the principle, besides the location, and you got to have a great, great food plan, you know? It's just like, it's just, you got to have good food. Reasonable price. And that was it. You, you put a good product, a reasonable price, and those are, I think that's... And, Man, you, you, you pulled so many buttons. Um, number one, a lot of you, my guys, might not know this, but that bridge, what was the name of the hotel right by Grace Inn? Remember, did, remember, yeah, did, you, Grace Inn. did you ever meet Old Man Grace? Yes. Yeah, and uh, I, I met him several times, and he actually um, built that hotel there, the Grace Inn, which is now, he's passed away, and it's what, the Four Seasons? or Four Seasons. Four I Seasons. Think. But uh, he built that. The, the city of Phoenix said, uh, no, the, we don't need exit there. And he wanted to build that hotel. So he said, if you want an exit and a bridge there, you build it. So Grace Inn had that land there, which had um, the Grace Inn, that medical dental area, the, 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 um, the gas station, the McDonald's, all that. He owned all that. And he built that bridge. And Ahwatukee wasn't part of Phoenix back then. No. And it was county. Yeah. It was county. So then years go by, years go by, then Phoenix come along and says, no, we want to annex that old Ahwatukee. Remember Epico Market? Yeah, Epico Market. So they annexed this, and so then they applied city taxes to uh, uh, Grace Inn and all that stuff, and Grace Inn said, hell no. So he took it to court and won, and he said, and um, so if you look at a map of Phoenix, um, that Elliott Road exit on 51st, that area land there is the part, only part of Ahwatukee that's not part of Phoenix. It's Sedgwick County, which means if you're the Grace Inn and you call the police, you're basically going to call the sheriff. Yeah. It's not Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. And um, that, that was a neat story. And he, he just didn't think it's fair that, I mean, he paid a lot of money to build that bridge. And then for him to build that bridge and develop that whole area, then Phoenix to come back and tax it. Correct. It's like, well, that's double dipping. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but but back to opening up your own restaurant. Um, they're scared. They got a guaranteed job. Maybe they work at Honeywell or Motorola or Intel, and their their uh, their passion is not there. They're just kind of doing the daily the daily dig. Um, they got a wife and kids, family, whatever. What, um, how do you how do you justify the risk of giving up a sure thing? to go open up a restaurant that might have an 80% mortality rate in two years. I guess there's as chances you gotta take, a risk you have to take, but you gotta give it all that love and, and effort and uh, you put a, yeah, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort, it really does. It really does. You gotta know what you're doing though. You gotta know what you're doing. The food is number one. That's now did you have a family member that owned a restaurant, an no. uncle, a cousin? Where did where did you just learn it from the I school just, of hard knocks? <laughs> I have no idea. I just like I, I I think from eating out, eating, going to restaurants. Ever ever since I was very young, I always always liked going to restaurants. And uh, so you you know what good service is. You know what a good environment is. You know what good food is. So final, well, I got you five more minutes. So then talk about the journey. So, so you would go in there. There was Abco grocery store and yeah. that went under, and uh, there was a Circle K there. And, and then, then you had the bank at the end. Remember, there was a bank at the end of the little strip mall. Yep. Yeah. And the and bank. then um, I guess Circle K went to move to the corner, mm -hmm. and they couldn't have two Circle Ks hundred yards yeah. apart. So they and they had the guest pump. They they, they pump. closed all that down, and then you and then KFC went under. Or what happened to KFC? The, and how did you? The, uh, and, well, the KFC the the, the, the uh, they went under. They closed the doors a long time. It was a vacant uh, building for about a few years, at least four or five years. Four or five years. Yeah, it was a vacant vacant building. So so obviously you got a good price on it if it's been vacant for four. Well, you know I really don't know the transaction at that time because at that time I was just getting ready to uh, do the comeback because what what happened is that I when when not uh, when my sister Margaret took over um, uh, the burrito company, okay, because I went into a venture downtown, into a big development that I was invited by Five Simons to come in as an anchor tenant. 
And uh, was that when he was the governor? Yeah, that was before. That was the year before he started running for governor. And uh, and he got impeached, didn't he? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, he got impeached. There were there were two of them since I've been here. Who's the one before him? The auto dealer. You're talking about Paul Fennin that got impeached? No, it was the... Uh, not, not Paul Fennin, Meekum? Meekum. <laughs> yeah, I, um, it was kind of funny. I mean, um, Ryan, Google how many governors in Arizona have been impeached, but I, I think... Um, it's only Meekum. Meekum. Meekum and him. And Simonson? Yeah, that, that, that was crazy times. I mean, I mean, it's, it's two not, crazy it, Republicans. It, it's why it's weird times Oops. when Oops. when you get a uh, two governors impeached. But anyway, so you were in uh, Symington's project. Uh, project a year before he became the governor. Yeah. So Meekum was impeached. <laughs> Symington, yeah, Symington was impeached. like Nixon. Nixon yeah. didn't get impeached. Yeah, he, he was he wasn't impeached. He was he just resigned. Yeah. But wasn't it part of that development? Wasn't it um, financial industry? Yeah, yeah, he, there was a lot of, you know, it's too much going on because the fact is that, you know, the development downtown where I went, he borrowed from the retirement, uh, the, the some kind of union retirement fund that came out of Washington State or whatever. And uh, so the money wasn't being paid back and whatever. So it's a big thing, you know, it's just like, yeah. So I just noticed your bracelet. Who's on, that's, that's the Virgin Mary on your bracelet. Right. I've never, that's beautiful. And I've never, great, never seen that. Isn't it cool? Yeah. I, and that's for, why I bought uh, it. Sitting over here, I, I have to have readers. Yeah. I thought it was a watch. So, so anyway, going back to, to, to your the, the original question, in fact, is that, so I was uh, right after, um, um, after the collapse of the restaurant that I had downtown at the Five Shanty Project, it was a major restaurant. It was a beautiful, beautiful restaurant. It was called Cafe La Tasca. And there again, I wanted to do something very unusual that had never been done before in Phoenix. So I brought a, a cook, a, a chef from, that was actually lived, I didn't bring him from Spain. So I incorporated, incorporated Spanish dishes from Spain and also the top dishes of Mexico, the Republic of Mexico. So I had half of the menu was Spanish, half of the menu was Mexican. And uh, I was the first one to introduce tapas. So I had a tacos and tapas bar also in, in the restaurant. It was a cool restaurant, but unfortunately it just didn't work out. We, our neighboring business when uh, Arizona Center opened, so everybody was going to the Arizona Center. We became the poor kids in the block and nothing was happening. Location, so, location, location. Yeah, and it was, a, and they had bed parking and the whole thing. It was just like, so it was time to go. So after three years, this is where, you know, again, collapse. And so then I, I was, and, uh, this friend of mine, Marley Porter, that I told you earlier, the architect who wanted to do the Chandler, the, uh, the Chandler project, the tower, he became property manager of a big resort in Alabama. And this resort was bought by the Baptist Foundation. Believe it or not, been sorry. So anyway, they were having, and this resort had a huge conference center with a big restaurant and bar. And Marley, flew me to Alabama, I says, I want you to be our director here for the food and beverage in a section of it. And he said, are you kidding me in Alabama? Yeah, okay, I'll take the job, so I did. So that was a while, I, I got to see Alabama and I learned a lot about the people in the South, I learned, I learned a lot about the cuisine in the South and it was really quite uh, rewarding. So when I came back to Phoenix, I didn't want to go back into restaurant business at all, I didn't want to work with restaurants, so. I went to behavioral health services and I became case manager working with kids and things like that. And then um, it's time for me to retire. So now I started going into my arts. I started doing originally what I wanted to always do. So I went into print making and uh, doing some wonderful pieces of artwork and, and uh, working out of my house and fixing my home. And, and then I come over here with Margaret, give her a, a rough time, and... <laughs> how often do you come over here and work at radio company with Margaret? How often? Yeah, how Four often? days a week. What hours? Yeah. No, I'm there at six o'clock in the morning, and I'm there till noon, two o'clock. So is, is the breakfast burrito um, bigger business than the lunch versus the dinner? I would, you know what, on the weekends they're bigger. Breakfast because everybody, yeah, the weekends, yeah, because everybody, you know, everybody wants to go and have a breakfast burrito. Yeah. Everybody now at Tukey probably knows the burrito company now. Yeah. 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 I love it.
Yeah. We just wake up, you're having a lazy day, you're going to watch the yeah. game. And you know what really makes it? And I'll tell you what it is. And I keep saying, you get a good product and good price. I go to other places, you know, and I'm not going to mention names, you know, like this, you know, called Beto's, you know, whatever. You get, you get breakfast burritos, they're like $2 more. Anywhere else, it costs you from $1 to $2 more of what we have over here. And you get a better product in a bigger world. And uh, that's, that's, that's... So are you that's selling it. some of these paintings you're working on? I sure am. You know what, Ryan? This is so cool. So on Tuggy Town, we'll post this podcast under the restaurant section. But when we post this on the restaurant, um, you can um, comment... And you can um, enter, um, post JPEG pictures of all your art. I mean, I think that'd be very fun to see. Because you're very special, the fact that you're um, into cuisine. Most men aren't into yeah. cuisine. You're into art. You're, uh, yeah. you know. Well, I, I studied I, art. That was my original. Yeah, that, that's, that's really neat. Yeah. I think you're a really special guy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. And I really enjoyed knowing you for yeah. 30 years. And, it's been uh, a while, huh? And uh, thanks for being a strong And you pillar. know what? Let me let me go back on what you say that. when I And it's, this is really something very special. The fact is that when we opened, you know, back in, in 83, the, like in the evenings and weekends, there were these families that would come in with their kids, maybe two or three kids. Mom and pop, you know, would come with their children. Now... Those kids are coming with their kids to I the know. burrito company. It's just amazing. Oh, I know. It. it is so neat. I mean, yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's a gift. Yeah, I it's can't tell you how many children are coming in with their dad. Yeah. And I remember when hey, their I dad you, was carried like, in in a, in a baby seat and sat by the dental chair while yeah. he was working on their mom. Yeah. And now that dad is doing the same thing. And I, and I and some of them I really embarrassed because it's yeah. true. I mean, I, I remember this one guy was coming in. I said uh, to his child, I said, uh. I change your dad's diaper. <laughs> and he goes, that's not true. And his dad says, well, I don't, I don't remember, but did you? I'm like, yeah, I actually did because <laughs> your, your, your mom was on laughing gas or whatever the heck, but uh, that was funny. Yeah. But uh, good, good times. All right. Well, well thank, uh, you. thank you so much. And I'll see you. you at the burrito company. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Thank you.